And so what we were talking about was the importance of the way that cells hold on to their environment um, and, and the fact that, that most cells, normal cells, well, let me, I'll take my glass off, but and most cells, the normal cells uh, are always holding on to something, right? The only, the only cells that aren't doing that are blood cells, which are flowing around in the body. And even they tend to kind of roll along the edges of blood vessels when they're going to stop. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we talk about metastasis, because it's really important. If the cell doesn't stop, it's not going to be able to leave the circulation. So how do you stop? But these integrins are one of the things, and here is a picture of the integrin in a, in a diagram. They leave the, the cell membrane and they interact with this basal lamina or the uh, sheets of tissue, the extracellular matrix, and these sort of thin fibrous structures that cells anchor themselves on. And again, people often ask, one of the questions is, well, if cells are sticking to them, where do they come from? And the answer is they come from cells. The cells secrete these proteins themselves, and they actually orient the grid, right, by laying along it. And then if you look in a tissue, you'll see this very nice, even all the cells facing the same way lined up, because they orient these long polymers uh, alongside themselves. Now... Again, this is what it looks like. I don't remember if we got this far. And we might have been right about here, right right at here-ish when we stopped. So this is just a, 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 a fluorescent picture of the same thing. You can see this very nice grid structure looking at different, uh, the fibronectin and the stro these different proteins that are in the stroma. So it's complicated. That's one thing to take away, right? It's not one protein or something. There's a mixture of these things. And when we talk about metastasis, you'll see that it's not just that grid. There's actually a lot of things stuck to that, right? So there's uh, growth factors that are out there. There's enzymes that are stuck to this grid. And um, the cancer cells use them, okay? Now... The extracellular matrix, or ECM, right, that's extracellular matrix, that's produced by the, the myofibroblasts, these, these uh, fibroblasts uh, that are in the uh, surrounding uh, the cancer cells, surrounding in particular the blood vessels, is not normal. It's very, it's very thick and hard. And I think I mentioned, I know I, I, I was talking about when if, you, if one does a breast self-exam, right, uh, that you, the way that, that breast lumps are, de the cancer is detected is because they're hard, right? I mean, they're, you know, you feel a lump, right? People say, oh, I felt a lump. And, and that the reason that it feels hard like that is not the cancer cells. It's because of this weird extracellular matrix that they produce. It's very fibrous and, and hard. And the, the fancy term for that is desmoplastic. And you can immediately forget that because you'll never you'll never use that word unless you're an oncologist. But it's hard, okay. Uh, and there are these growth factors like insulin-like growth factor and proenzymes, that is inactive enzymes, enzymes that are in their inactive form that are tethered to the extracellular matrix. And when we'll talk about it, when it really becomes important is when you're going to remodel tissue, in other words, break down and rebuild, that's remodel, and we're going to do that uh, when, we, when we develop a blood supply, which we'll talk about today, and most importantly for cancer patients, when the cancer cells spread, right? You can't move through a solid sheet if you're a cancer cell, you have to cut your way, and they do that with enzymes. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, so here is a, a good example for you. Here is normal breast tissue. Uh, you have uh, the, the normal <coughs> uh, tissue. You have a little bit of connective tissue in here, and you have lots of fat cells, right? Breasts are mostly blob of fat, right? And so these are all the adipocytes, the fat-containing cells. Here is the connective tissue. Here's a tumor. Right, the, 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 the fat cells are pretty much gone, 
right? And what you have instead when you look in the tumor is just massive amounts of connective tissue. There are some blood vessels, right? You're the red, right? So you do have blood vessels that are in there that you don't really see. There are blood vessels, of course, in normal fat tissue. You can see some red right here. You do need some, some uh, uh, oxygen and everything in normal tissue, but there's more of it in the tumor. But really what you see is this total replacement of the normal cells with all of these fibroblasts and tumor cells. And it, this is a hard... Um, Thing. So if this is the kind of thing where if you're reaching, this is what you're going to feel, right? It's stuck down to the other tissue and it's hard. I have a question. How can a tumor be developed in a breast tissue if breast is composed in most part from, from fat? So, well, most, most tumors form in the breast tumors. Most of them are epithelial cells. They form from the cells that line the ducts in the breast not from the fat cells. Uh, you can get uh, uh, cancer of fat cells. It's pretty, it's pretty uncommon, uh, right? I mean, that's a, an unusual form of sarcoma. But in general, 80% of cancers are epithelial cells, these cells that line tubes, line tissues. And in the case of, of breast cancer, and we'll probably see pictures later, uh, you have, uh, even in someone who's not nursing, the purpose of a breast is to make milk and deliver it. And so the ducts are the tubes that carry the milk to the nipple, right, where, where the baby would be able to get it. And these ducts are the cells, the duct cells are the ones that become cancerous. Right. And so it's it's actually the one of the early stages is actually called ductal carcinoma in situ, DCIS. You may have heard that term, uh, maybe, but that's a ductal carcinoma. Right. It's it's those cells that line the tubes. OK. And so when you have a, a normal uh, cell, uh, normal extracellular matrix, I mean, the cells move a certain way on that by reaching across this grid. Uh, you have sort of this, what's called amoeboid style uh, motility. It has to do with the way that they're crawling. And again, the take-home message for, for us is not so much the names of the genes or the type of mess, whether the type, but that when you get this change in the structure surrounding the cells, it affects the cells themselves. They start to act differently, and they start to, in, in fact, crawl, right? And they start to secrete enzymes, and that's what they show here in this picture. This little uh, this cell here is poking through an opening in the mesh, and that opening has to be formed by the breakdown of the mesh, which is caused by enzymes. Those enzymes can be produced by the cancer cells, and they can also be released from the extracellular matrix that they're already attached to, but then they have to be turned on, right? So proteolytic enzymes are very destructive, and, and just like the ones that we use to digest our food, they're produced in an inactive form because they'd be too dangerous to move around if they're chopping everything up. So you make them in an inactive form, and then you turn them on, usually by cleaving them, actually, just a little bit. So you essentially nick them to turn them into an active form. Okay? <clears throat> These proteases are called, uh, they're proteolytic enzymes, and they're called MMPs. Right? Their most common ones are called MMPs. It stands for matrix right cuz that's what they're working on and they're matrix metalloproteases and they're called metalloproteases because the active site actually includes a metal ion so matrix is what they work on it's where they come from metallo refers to the type of enzyme itself the active site and then p for just protease MMPs, and they're critical. People have worked very hard to develop inhibitors of these. If you could block this, you block the movement of the cell, you block metastasis. So far, no one has come up with something that works, that blocks them specifically in, and works only on the cancer. Okay. 
And <clears throat> one of the things that happens, and, and we're, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, is it's essentially you, you can look this up, you can learn more about it. I'll talk only a little bit about it is the fact that, that epithelial cells, when they're differentiated, that is, they're, they're looking like a liver cell or a prostate cell or a spleen cell, they're pretty stable. They stay where they're supposed to. They're doing the job they're supposed to do. But one of the things, and this is lots of cancers. It's not any particular cancer type. It's seen throughout a, a, most, if not all, cancers is that these epithelial cells kind of revert back to a more primitive state, more something that looks like the cells when they were developing, right? During the embryonic development, cells are migrating all over the place. You're forming organs. You're folding and making layers. There's a lot of movement, right? A lot of change. And what happens is the cancer cells kind of revert to that phenotype. And so that change right, the actual change itself from being a normal, happy epithelial cell to one of these more primitive, more mesenchymal type cells is called the epithelial mesenchymal transition, or EMT. And that's just for epithelial cells? Y yes, but most cancer cells are epithelial cells, so that's what we care about, yeah, right? So you have this epithelial mesenchymal transition, or EMT. And with this EMT comes a bunch of new capabilities, right? They start to act just like the cells did during development, during embryogenesis. And so they secrete different proteins. They're, they're able to move much more easily because, of course, that's important during the formation of a baby, right? I mean, you have to be able to move, form organs, migrate. Uh, so they don't die when they let go, right? We said that normal cells like to be held, hold on to something. Otherwise, they can be triggered to die by apoptosis. But these cells will lose that, right? They, they, they act much more primitive in a way. Does that make sense? So they sort of re-engage genes that are normally on only during development. Okay, and there's actually a lot known about this. There's a lot of people that study this and the, the, the homeotic genes and developmental genes that are turned back on. So it's a whole group of them. Okay? But part of what induces that EMT seems to be the extracellular matrix, right? That changes, that, that, that uh, allows them to start moving, and that movement sends signals into the nucleus, right? The integrins are tied into the nucleus. So what happens outside the cell affects the brain, right? There's feedback. And so when these things sense a different outside, it can change the way that they start behaving, right? At a genetic and phenotypic level. Right? They start expressing different genes, okay? And so this new knowledge, right, because we said that this is really pretty new, right? I mean, most of this work has been done in your lifetime, certainly, uh, which is pretty new, right? Uh, it's in the last 20 years, let's say, or so, where, where an appreciation of the cells other than the cancer cells has really come into its own. And so what does that have to, I mean, I'm sort of taking a step back, but you know how we study cancer, right? How does it affect your model systems? If we grow cells, cancer cells in culture, right? If we grow uh, cancer cells in a dish, does that look like it would inside a body, right? Is there an extracellular matrix? Are there other signals? No, 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 right? And so all of the, the, the best new work now, people are trying more and more to mimic the natural environment. How about the location of tumor implants? So many times, for instance, I'll give you an example. When people study prostate cancer, they very often implant the prostate tumor. So you'll take a human tumor, you put it into a mouse, they put it in the kidney. Is that the same extracellular matrix? Is that the same environment? Is it going to act like it would in, if it was in a prostate? So, so these are the kind of considerations that you 
that, that are affecting research based on this new knowledge. But importantly for you, even though you're not doing research, is more important that when you read research, when you guys are reading articles, and they're saying that, oh, you know, we found this great vaccine or this cancer works this way. You now have to critically look at that and say, does this system really replicate? Does it really mimic the, the normal system? Yeah, but, but that would change, like, a lot of the information that has been... Accepted. You got it. <laughs> it's sort of invalid, not completely, but it's... Absolutely. I mean, it makes you question a lot of things, right? We learn as we go. I mean, does it suck? Yes, but it's real. It's real, right? So now when we do breast cancer research, we put the cells at least in, like in mice, for instance, they inject them into the mammary fat pads, the equivalent of the breast for the mouse, right? If you put something where it's supposed to be, if you put it, if you inject it into the location, I'm going to give you a fancy word. It's called orthotopic, O-R-T-H-O-T-O-P-I-C. Orthotopic. Orthotopic. It means you're putting it in the, in the place where of, of its original origin. So breast into breast, prostate into prostate, lung into lung. Okay. And so this is really having an impact on, on future research. And I think you'll see that, that people are using more and more now of these what are called 3D culture systems in which you take a matrix. It may not be the matrix uh, from the tumor type itself, but at least it's a matrix. There's uh, something, and I, I don't know if I have a picture of it, um, uh, called matrigel, which is actually a, a extracellular matrix that's produced by rat cells that grow in culture. And people harvest it, and then they mix that with the tumor cells before they inject it. So at least they can hold on to something. At least it, it kind of mimics, <laughs> right? We, we're understanding it's an it, it's an approximation, right? It's as good as it can be. Uh, they try to mimic as best they can. So this is an old this is an older paper that shows you know that hey gene expression changes when we grow things in vitro right in in dishes in vitro means in in the lab right so when we oops. yeah so so when we grow things right it it changes things and so this is an an article that i thought was was very interesting because this really addresses some some fundamental things you may have heard about these cancer stem cells, all right? I, I think I may have mentioned them earlier. That's the idea that, that there's only a very small number of cells in a tumor that actually are able to go on and form a new tumor, right? That most of the cancer cells are still limited in their ability to proliferate. And it's only a small subset that's actually able to, to, to cause the cancer in another animal or to be transplanted. And so people were looking at this for years, and even including very recently, people are still studying this idea. And what these people did, and I'm not going to even show you all the data because it's just more of a concept, right? You don't really need to see it, is instead of injecting cells, just cells, they actually injected cells with matrigel, right? So with this mix of stuff. And what they showed in their study, and people argue with it, but what they showed in their study was that if you make this as in vivo looking as possible, right, if you treat the cells as nicely as possible and you give them this matrix to hold on to, that you can actually use single cells. So this is their argument that, hey, it's not one in a thousand. We can do this with, with very low numbers of cells. So their argument would be that it's not that there is a stem cell population, this small population, it's just that when you inject just the cells, you're selecting for those, right? That are able to do this without having an environment that looks like the body. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So people are still working on this, right? And and it it's now more and more apparent that tumors need stromal cells. It's not just that, oh, it's good to have you around, right? Oh, you're helpful. 
Uh, it's that they actually really need them. Okay, and I'm going to show you some, some good examples of that. Uh, I'll show you some data from a paper. <clears throat> but, but metastatic growth, when, when cancer spreads, it also has a stromal compartment, right? It's not just the original tumor, which already had all this other stuff. If you take, if you look at a growth that has arisen from scratch, de novo, right, from a, a new tumor that arises somewhere, it spreads from your lungs or something and it goes somewhere else, they have stromal cells, right? And it seems that most cancer cells will not form cell lines in, in large part because they need stromal interactions. Even though they're cancer cells, they're dependent on interactions with other cells. People tend to think of cancer cells as being just completely haywire and they're just running amok and doing whatever they want. But there are still limitations. They're still cells. And they, they may need others. Okay? And so some evidence on that, right, is that breast cancer cells, if you put them into an immunocompromised host, uh, it can actually give slow growth. If you take those breast cancer cells and you mix them with mammary fibroblasts, you get tumors in one-third the time. So all we did was give them some company, right? Some cells that were from their environment, and they grow much, much faster. Those fibroblasts are not cancer cells, but they're giving something to those ca cancer cells that they need. Okay? And... It's now thought, and this is, this is something that's actively being studied. We're not talking about 20 years ago. We're talking about now, right? Uh, that the stromal cells co-evolve with the tumor, and they may actually become genetically uh, altered themselves. And so there are some models, right? <clears throat> so some examples of it. If you sublethally irradiate, fibroblast, uh, and then put pancreatic cancer cells in, you get more aggressive tumors than when you implant them with normal fibroblasts. That is, if the fibroblasts are damaged genetically, they're better able to help the tumor cells. Right? Why that is, I don't know the answer, right? I don't know what, what they're doing there, but, but what are they doing, right? Um, and what they found, again, in this one was that if you ectopically express, ectopic, remember I just said orthotopic, ectopic means in the wrong place. So something that is where happens where it's not supposed to. The most common term of that word, when you would ever hear it medically, actually, is when people have ectopic pregnancies, when, they, when the baby implants in the, in the fallopian tube or something instead of the uterus. They call it an ectopic pregnancy. I don't know if you ever heard that ter ter term. But, but ectopic means in the wrong place. So ectopic expression of the hepatocyte growth factor or transforming growth factor, beta, uh, by genetically modified fibroblasts can actually induce breast cancer in normal breast cells. So this is a case in which the stroma can drive the development of a cancer. Okay. So it, it's actually really, really important. And so we have, they have seen alterations in, in fibroblasts from cancer stromal cells. So the neighborhood is not as deranged as the cancer, but it's not perfect either. Right. It gets heavily influenced. Okay. Okay. So, uh, why, what makes the fibroblast, what makes the neighborhood so volatile, right? Why would these neighboring cells start to behave weird? And one reason seems to be oxidative stress. <clears throat> because this oxidative, remember we talked about endlessly now, I've talked about how much inflammation is important in cancer. And that includes the production of these reactive oxygen species both by the immune system and internally uh, by defective uh, respiration in the cancer cells, uh, that these, uh, the oncogenes can actually induce the fibroblast nearby to behave differently, right, by stressing them, 
right? So the fibroblasts aren't trying to help the cancer. They certainly wouldn't want to if they knew what they were doing, but they don't know what they're doing anyway. They're just cells, right? Uh, <clears throat> but they're actually triggered to behave differently and, and help the cells. And so that has led to this model uh, in which the tumorigenesis and a new word for you, I'm sure, stromagenesis, right, the development of a stroma, are actually intertwined, right? It's a co-development that the, that the cancer cells are changing clearly. I'm not taking away anything that we talked about before. They have their oncogenes activated. They have tumor suppressors inactivated. But in order to make that full step, the jump from I'm an abnormal cell to I'm a tumor that's going to cause problems, right? They need this stroma. And this stroma is in a normal situation, probably inhibitory uh, after it is induced by, re by reactive oxygen species or other uh, growth factors and things produced by the cancer cells. It becomes uh, what they call primed. And again, this is a smooth thing. There's no such thing as normal primed activated. This is a gradient, right? Uh, people name it to make it easy to talk about, but it's a fluid thing. And uh, then it becomes activated. So here's, a, here's the data I want to show you, and this one is actually pretty old, right? This is, this is actually a fairly old paper. So, but you are still alive. <coughs> Yeah. In the other, in the last like slide, why when they became activated, it is irreversible? It's it's. I think that the, essentially there are genetic switches that are flipped that that aren't going back. I mean, so these are genetically unstable. There is they're they're unable to repair and reverse. But but that's a good question, and I don't know exactly. I don't know. I can't tell you the, the actual gene. The reference is here if you want to look at it, though. Yes. Right? I mean, so you'll get that when I put up the... I can send you the PowerPoint. You already have this PowerPoint, actually, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So here's... This was... This, this research was... They were looking at prostate. Uh, and so what they did was they took... Uh, they took... Um, T antigen uh, human prostate epithelium. So T antigen, this is a viral protein from SV40. It's one of the uh, viral oncogenes. It's an, it, it enables the cells to grow. They're transformed, but they don't cause tumors. So there's a difference between being able to live forever and divide and things and cause a tumor inside an animal. And so they're transformed, but not tumorigenic. And then they have normal human uh, prostate fibroblasts, new, normal human prostate epithelial cells. These are the from the gland, right? These are the ones that would become the tumor. And then we have the carcinoma-associated fibroblasts. So these would be fibroblasts that would be separated out from an existing tumor. We got it? Okay. And so then they injected these. Uh, in, into the animals, and then they look to, to look at the at to see the the weight, right? Whether or not the tumor. So if you just put this is essentially a control normal fibroblast, or or just I'm sorry, the cancer associated fibroblast, you don't get any uh, tumors, right? If you if you put in the human prostate epithelial cells by themselves, these transformed cells, it looks like this. But if you mix them so that you have now cancer-associated fibroblasts injected with T antigen-transformed human cells, right? So they weren't together before, right? These, you, you get the experiment, right? We're mixing them now. So these cancer-associated fibroblasts came from a pre-existing tumor. These are just cells that are transformed. But when we mix them and inject them, we get all kinds of growth. Okay, and so this is pretty much one of the most obvious graphs ever, or, or figures, right? This is what they get when they pull out, right, the, 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 the tumor. Here's the cancer-associated fibroblast, T-antigen, 
right? So this is the mixture of cells, and this one that looks completely like nothing, this one is the normal uh, human prostate epithelium, right? Without, without the CAF, right? This is normal human prostate fibroblast with transformed cells. This is cancer fibroblast transformed cells. So these fibroblasts, these CAFs, are acting very, very differently than the normal ones, right? Was that clear? Because I think that came out a little cockeyed. That makes sense? And a thing to notice about this, because we're going to talk about this next time, is that this thing is very, very bloody, right? Lots of blood vessels. And the reason for that is because tumors promote blood vessels to form. And we'll, that's our next topic, right? Okay. Okay. So what are these cancer-associated fibroblasts doing? Uh, they're, they're producing lots of growth factors in general. Uh, they're producing um, growth factors that help provide the go signals to the cancer cells. They're producing matrix metalloproteases that are enabling the cancer cells to move, right, by di di digesting the extracellular matrix. Uh, they're producing extracellular matrix proteins. That's where this stuff comes from. So they're making lots of that. Uh, and they're also stimulating blood vessel formation. It's up here in this top uh, part of the, of the figure. It has a v blood vessel. And that blood vessel has a fibroblast wrapped around it, right? That's that myofibroblast. And then it's got the endothelial cells that make up the tube. And these fibroblasts, these cancer-associated fibroblasts, are stimulating the development of a blood supply. I mean, they, they, they all, every cell needs a blood supply to supply oxygen and, uh, and uh, nutrients and to take away waste. Um, the tumors, as we'll see, they do develop a blood supply. The blood supply tumors develop is abnormal. And I'll show you pictures of that in a moment. But they do need one or uh, they cannot get beyond about 100 nanometers. Right, so you, you can't make a tumor that's big enough to hurt anyone without a blood supply. Right? Any tumor that you can see that's big enough to hurt someone has a blood supply. Right? Cells can't be that far from a, a, a food and oxygen source. Okay. And so this is just some more examples. Uh, stromal fibroblasts that present in human breast carcinomas promote tumor growth and angiogenesis by secreting essentially uh, growth factors and uh, targeting molecules, right? SDF1 is a molecule that helps guide cancer cells, breast cells in particular, to distant sites. So they're essentially helping uh, the cancer cells. Okay, so what about cancer treatments? Right? I mean, when we used to think of cancer, when, when uh, Farber and all those people were doing cancer work in the 50s, when people, the, the, the father of chemotherapy, right, uh, like Dana Farber Cancer Institute, if you've heard of that, right, his name was Sidney Farber. When these people were doing their work, they pictured cancer as essentially cancer cells. And so how does this new knowledge influence the way that we look at things? And uh, it's, it's important. Uh, how does treatment alter the tumor host environment? And so again, this is an, an, an older paper, but uh, what they're looking at is essentially bone metastases and showing all of these different components that are involved in a bone metastasis. So you have a tumor cell that's in a bone, but you also have all of these interactions. You have the osteoblasts. These are cells that make bone. You have osteoclasts. These are cells that remove bone, right? And the imbalance between these two is one of the things that is a leading cause of death for cancer patients, right? The breakdown of their bone and hypercalcemia, right? Uh, the extracellular matrix, the immune cells, endothelial cells, stromal cells, right? It's a network. 
And if we don't take that into account, we're going to not doing the patients any good. Right? It's now thought that the, that the tumor microenvironment is very important for controlling d drug sensitivity. And, of course, the converse of sensitive is resistant. So uh, drug resistance. And so that chemotherapy can cause changes in the, the uh, stromal cells, causing them to produce, it stresses them, right? They get damaged too, and they're stressed, and they produce things that can actually protect the nearby cells. Now, in, in a non-cancer setting, that may be exactly what you want, right? If, if a cell is damaged, wouldn't you want it to help nearby cells? I mean, it makes sense, right? If, you, if you're accidentally exposed to a toxin, I would love to think that my cells are working together and helping each other out, right? But it doesn't work so good if the cell that you're helping is actually a cancer cell. And because many of the drugs that we use are so toxic, uh, it influences not just the cancer cell. We need to now study how does it influence nearby cells. Right? Because if cancer responded to treatment, we wouldn't be sitting here right now, probably. Right? Yeah. Do you think uh, that in the future that could remove chemotherapy as an option for treating cancer? I mean, chemotherapy is being replaced now. Right? I mean, it's slowly being replaced because everyone recognizes that it's generally toxic and. And, you know, and right, and we're looking for more and more targeted drugs. By the time uh, you're treating patients, Mariana, I don't think you'll be using nearly as much, if any, chemotherapy. But as of now, we are still using drugs that were actually used in World War I to kill people, derivatives of the mustard gases that were used in World War I. Um, I don't think those types of chemicals will be, be used anymore. <laughs> Okay, and uh, again, uh, this is another example because this this is a general chemotherapy, a toxic drug, but but the response to targeted therapies is also influenced by the stromal cells, the ones we just talked about that are not doesn't don't make you so sick. So a BRAF inhibitor, this is a, a kinase inhibitor. Uh, it can be sensitive to that. Uh, you, and, and here is our uh, cancer cell. This is a, a melanoma cell. BRAF is, is commonly mutated in melanoma, a skin cancer. But uh, when you treat them, one of the things that can lead to resistance is the production of the stroma of the hepatocyte growth factor. Hepatocyte growth factor is the ligand for the MET receptor and the met receptor actually turns on you ready emt right the epithelial mesenchymal transition so uh that that pathway will uh tend to make those cells more resistant okay now <coughs> Right? It's, it's really clear <laughs> that, that the environment of the cells absolutely influences uh, the receptiveness to the cancer drug. So cell adhesion-mediated adhesion drug resistance. Mechanistically, the fibronectin right, resulted from the beta-integra-mediated amplification of IL-6 signaling. So I told you integrins communicate, it changed the, the fibronectin, which is that fibrous protein outside the cell. It led to an increase in cell survival, and it was increased through increased expression of BCL, XL member BCL, right, anti-apoptosis protein. It increased that, and it decreased BIM, which was one of our B words, right? That was one of our pro-apatotic. So <clears throat> this alteration with the extracellular matrix leads to gene expression changes in the cell that make that cell resistant to apoptosis. <clears throat> this one I thought was interesting. Uh, this was something that showed that radiation treatment actually... 
uh, can permanently alter the tissue microenvironment and it can affect the uh, response of the cells to treatment. So even if you, if you, because very often, right, chemotherapy and radiation are used in combination. And so what this says is that if you were to irradiate a tumor to try to shrink it, let's say, before you treat with chemo, you may be irreversibly changing that tumor with the radiation, not the cancer cells, but the environment, in a way that makes it no longer really responsive to the chemo that you're going to then give. So this is something that people are just now able to understand, really, with the deep sequencing and epigenetic, you know, the methylation sequencing and things like that. Um, is there any way in which that can be helpful or it's always... No, a absolutely. That's a great question, and we'll, we'll talk about it. But, but, but some of the, the big cancer drugs now are aimed at the stroma. In particular, the, the angiogenesis uh, derived tissues, right? The tissues that are bringing blood vessels in. Um, there have not been any successful treatments that I'm aware of targeting the fibroblasts in any way. So what about these stem cells? It, again, we, we talked about them a little bit today. The idea is that in a normal tissue, Stem cells live in a very specific niche, right? They're not just spread all over the place. These are your important cells that are going to be replicating throughout your life, and they require care, and they have helpers uh, that help them. And so the, same, the question then is, if in fact cancer stem cells exist, and there's a subset of cells that is important, to uh, the growth of the cancer and spread of the cancer is the same thing true. And we don't, we don't know that, right? We don't know much about the niche of the cancer cell inside the tumor. Right? That's, that's being studied now. When it comes to the metastasis of, right, or spread of cancer, we do think that that is dependent on the formation of a very specific niche uh, in the distant location. So tumors can secrete proteins that can recruit stromal cells. I said that metastases always have a stromal component to them. And it seems to be that they can actually lay the groundwork out ahead of time, which is completely boggling to me. It's just amazing. Uh, but but the, the stromal cells can be called from the bone marrow, uh, from other locations, and directed to a place before the tumor, even the tumor cells even get there. Like preparing a place. You for got it. You got it. And that's exactly right. Wow. Yeah. So. Uh, there, there's actually some really good data for this. There's a guy who does some really clever stuff. I don't remember if I have a picture of that in here. Remind me, though, Mariana, and I'll, I'll try to post it for you. Um, but there's, there is a, a guy who studies. He, he has made the stromal cells of cancers uh, fluorescent green. And he actually sees that the stromal cells can leave the tumor and go to a distant location like lung or something from the skin, right? So they can go quite far distances in small clumps and that those stromal cells that go to the lungs actually set up shop and they get there and start to be begin to make an environment that's welcoming for the cancer cells. But if, uh, in the literature, they don't know much about the niche, how, I don't know what the, the tissue needs or how the tissue should be to be specific or good for the tumor formation. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we're learning now. I mean, we're learning, I mean, this is a really like kind of cutting edge stuff, right? I mean, this is exactly what we're learning. What do they need? When do they make it? Uh, how are they guided to the location? How do they even know where the stromal cells went, 
right? How do they get there? Um, so the, 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 they can secrete things like transforming growth factor beta, vascular endothelial derived growth factor, one that we'll talk about a lot in the next couple minutes because this is where blood vessels come from. People just refer to it as VEGF, right? VEGF. And the uh, tumor necrosis factor, alpha. So uh, I don't know. No, I don't have a picture. Remind me and, and, and I'll, I'll show you so you can see the pictures because this guy has great uh, a model in which from the fluorescence yeah for the, yeah what he does is he 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 actually welds two mice together it is very bizarre he he joins two mice together and they live fused together like that one of them is green in its in its fur in the skin the other is not and then he kind of rolls <laughs> rolls it and he he stitches it can you see uh, Her skin and stitches the two animals together and then it's called parabiosis. He fuses them together and he allows them to form blood vessels and everything. And then he rolls them and cuts so that the what you're left with is a mouse that's almost all white, but it's got a green patch. Right? And then he puts the tumor cells that he also can follow into that green patch. And now he can follow all of the stromal cells from the skin as well as the tumor cells anywhere they go in the body. And what he has shown is that the stromal cells tend to leave the tumor in small clumps, three, four, five cells at a time. If they leave individually, I think one cell breaks off, it probably dies. If it's too big, it gets stuck. But in a small clump, they can move through the body and they can go somewhere and set up shop so that when that tumor cell gets there, it has the environment that it needs. Okay. Do you think that there will be a way to stop the protein secreted by the tumors to act or to move to, move to the... Other yeah, so the so to the you mean to block like the matrix metalloproteases? Yes. Yeah, so that's a very that's a great question, and I hope you work in lab. Um, but uh, no one has successfully done it in a way that doesn't that, that that can be used as a treatment. So you can block those in in vivo in vitro. You can block them in model systems, but you they've never had success in patients. So one of the ways that green tea, you know, you've heard, of course, green tea is supposed to be good for you, right? Yeah. And one of the things that green tea does that's supposed to help it block cancer is it actually inhibits the matrix metalloproteases, yeah. right? Uh, so green tea is thought to maybe actually exert some of its influence by doing exactly what you said. But there are no approved treatments uh, that work by blocking MMPs. I, I would assume that if you did a clinical trial on MMP, you know, if you did a search on clinicaltrials.gov and typed in MMP and cancer, you probably would find a bunch. But as far as I know, none of them have succeeded. Yeah. It's a good idea. If you can keep them from moving, you're much better off. And this is an unrelated, this is not cancer, but I thought I would show it to you anyway because it's interesting. What they did here, they use this stuff uh, they call hydrogel, which is like matrogel, right? So it's proteins, the connective tissue proteins. And what they did was they showed that if you give a pig a heart attack, I don't know how you do that. Maybe you just show them bacon or something. I don't know. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you induce a heart attack in a pig, uh, and then, so you have tissue damage. If you inject into that damaged heart tissue some of the, the uh, protein, like the matrogel, the hydrogel, versus not doing it, the, the one that was injected fills up and heals with new muscle tissue, and the one that does not, does not. Right? This is all empty, and this is, is much better healed. You see the difference? Yeah. And so this shows you how important the stroma is, not only in cancer, but in other, other, other diseases. I was just wanted to show you, it's not just cancer, right? The, the other cells, which again, we would ignore most of the time, we're learning that's a bad idea.